TitleMatchNetwork.com. Welcome to another edition of the RF Video Shoot Interview Series. Today we're joined by none other than the Latin heartthrob, Al Perez. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. Um, basically, my very first question is how you got started in the wrestling business. Well, I wrestled amateur for seven years back down in Tampa, Florida. And I wrestled uh, one of the great Malinko's kids. Uh, back then, it was Shelly. Right. And uh, now he wrestles as uh, Dean Malinko. And he took a look at me and said, well, hey, why don't you come out and give it a try? This was many, many moons ago. And I went out there and said, yeah, I'll do it part time, you know, a couple of years here and there before I go into something else. And we ended up going on there uh, 14 years. Were you a wrestling fan growing up? Not really. No. Mm -mm. I, I've seen the great Malenko a few times and he was like one of the scariest people I ever met. And he was just like, ooh, you know, this guy was too much and everything. But uh, he took me in and he started showing me the ropes, a little amateur background. And then what he taught me was the rest. So basically he was your mentor? The yeah. Dean's father? He, Dean started me off. Dean's father started me off. And then he introduced me to a man, Carl Gotch. And Carl Gotch is probably one of the greatest wrestlers, shoot wrestlers in the world. He's got to be near 80 today. And I'll tell you what, he's probably still one of the toughest men I know. Talk about the training that you went through as far as you know. Uh, well, when you're going from amateur into professional, <clears throat> of course, it's a lot different. You know, you've got your falls and everything and your bumps that you learn how to take. People knock it so much to say, well, how can you get hurt? You know, it's all fake, this, uh, but when you got in that ring and you start hitting the ropes, just running the ropes back and forth, I've seen people come up with bruises from head to toe. <clears throat> Didn't know how they got there. Well, just hit them ropes a few times and you'll know what it's about. Then when you learn how to fall, it's falling, not, not where you're gonna get hurt, but controlling your body and controlling your opponent's body or your partner's body. Right. Today's standards is your partner's body. And once you learn that, it takes off from there. What was the most uh, valuable lesson that you were taught when you first started in the business? Take care of yourself and the people you're in the ring with. Because there's always somebody out there jealous who will try to hurt you. And pretty much that's what happened to me at the end. At the end? Yeah, well, uh, about seven and a half years ago, I blew out my elbow. Just too much abuse and everything, and uh, that did it. You know, just wrong move at the wrong time with the wrong guy, and took care of that. You know, we're going to talk about that actually later on. I was going to ask you about your injury. So, okay. Um, as far as getting the business back in the day that you got into the business, how would you compare it to today if somebody was getting the business today? Whew. Back then, when I started, professional wrestling was wrestling, and from the change from then to I don't even watch it anymore. It's it's gone too far. It's gone away from the sport. It took away from a beautiful sport that it was to too much showbiz. Right. And there are some great athletes out there now still and bigger than I've ever seen them before. But the wrestling ability to it, it's still called wrestling. They don't have it. Do you think we'll ever go back to the old days of wrestling? Or do you think that it's wrong? Uh It'll take a lot of money to turn it back into the wrestling, the sport that it was. I think if somebody did it, I think it would take off really good. But then you have to reteach the fans, basically. Yeah, spoiled. yeah. They're spoiled just seeing the stuff that they see. Today's wrestling is society. All you got to do is look out in the street and you can see what wrestling is all about. It's all violence, sex, you know, and, and you go from there. Back in the storylines, let's call it a storyline from back in my day, they built a story around wrestling. They get two opponents and they would build a story around the wrestling. And that's what we did. What were some of the first territories that you worked? <clears throat> Our first territory I ever started was in Canada, Br uh, Brunswick, New, New Brunswick or somewhere, I don't know, huh. somewhere up in Canada for Emile Dupree. Right. And I lasted there three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Uh, I just couldn't take away being away from home so much, you know, and I lasted three weeks there. I came back home. I took like uh, three or four months off and I started in California. What year was that around? Ooh, I'm going to say it was like 1980. Right. <laughs> was Roddy Piper back there? I think he was. Roddy Piper there. just left. He just left there. Did you have any like run-ins with him? No. As as, uh -uh. no okay, so you didn't. What was the locker room like at the time? 
That room was quiet. I mean, there was no, uh, the animosity wasn't like it is from what I hear about it today. Right. That locker room was quiet, quiet, and nobody hassled anybody. It was, it was just, you know, it was still a sport. Right. What are your uh, memories of Buzz Sawyer? Buzz Sawyer was a character. He was, he was a great amateur wrestler also from down in Florida. Right. And uh, he was good. Buzz Sawyer was a pretty good athlete at one time, and I guess the showbiz got to him. Also, I believe uh, Buddy Rose was in the dressing room at the time when you were down there. Yeah, Buddy Rose was down there. He's, a, he's another character. Not <laughs> a lot of characters in this business. Any good stories on uh, either no, of those stuff? No, no, not really. <clears throat> um, from there, where did you go after that? Ooh, from there, I went to, to uh, Ohio. I started a little little group out in Ohio, out of uh, Pensacola. Would that be for the Fullers or? Yeah, Ron Fuller started running one up there and didn't go out too good. So I, there was another three week territory. <laughs> Moved down to Pensacola and stayed there a few months. Went into New Zealand and that's when I started. How different was a locker room back then as to now? And what do you prefer? Uh, I prefer back then. Everybody stayed to themselves and did their jobs, did what they were supposed to do. And, and left it in the locker room, that was it. Now, I, I don't know what year exactly it was that you went down to Texas for uh, Joe Blanchard for uh, Southwest Championship Wrestling. What year was that around? I'm gonna say that was like 82, 83. What are your memories of uh, Joe Blanchard? Joe Blanchard was a good guy. He was, he was a pretty good guy. And he, he was one that, to me, he wanted to keep it as wrestling, as a sport the way it was, and that's what he tried to do. Who were some of the guys that you worked with down there? Oh man, I couldn't tell you. I don't remember. Huh. Back yeah. then, it was uh, you know, the sheep wasn't the bush. Down. Yeah, it wasn't the bush records. It was sheep herders, and it wasn't uh, Butch. It was John Boyd. Right. And uh, Luke was a good guy. Luke was really, he was up and up. John, you couldn't turn your back on. He, he'd give it to you. <laughs> but Luke was right up. <clears throat> Thoughts on uh, Bobby Jaggers and uh, Bob Sweetan. Bobby Jaggers was, uh, like I said, they were all characters. Bob Sweet Ten, you couldn't really turn your back on another. He was another, whatever it took to backstab you or get ahead, Bob Sweet Ten did it. Jaggers was a little bit of a fool, but a, a really good guy. He was uh, he was up and up too. What was the uh, road schedule like back then? Because <clears throat> I know they did what, the TV tapings in the supermarket? Yeah. Right. And uh, when they had a junction. Right. It was a junction back then. Uh, the road trips weren't that bad. It was maybe 1,500 miles a week okay. compared to the last territory that I was working like that outside of WWF was uh, 2,500, 3,000 driving and about 10,000 flying. How many nights a week did uh, we they go run? six, seven nights a week. For Southwest? Yeah. Wow. Um, Scott Casey was there at the time. Scott Casey was a good guy. He, he was an athlete too. He didn't really look like a much of a wrestler, but Scott Casey could go. At the time, Scott was a little bit older than I was, and he, uh, we'd go to a gym, and he'd, he'd, out, he'd outdo me on a bench press. And back then, I was in the fours, and he did it like nothing. Huh. I think you were in a program uh, with Adrian Street at the time in Southwest Championship. Yeah. Wrestling. What was he like to work with? <clears throat> Adrian was a bad, wasn't a bad guy. His gimmick, his gimmick and mine didn't clash at all. Right. And he wanted to do things that, no. Like I said, you learn how to take care of yourself, and. Sometimes you have to say no, and that's what I did. Were there any guys that were helpful to you back then? Guys that were helpful. One of the, I think one of the best, and it was the Von Erichs. Fritz Von Erich, he took me in, and this was after uh, Southwest. Fritz Von Erich did me good, and Bruiser Brody. Bruiser Brody helped me out a lot. And uh, Gary Hart. What were some of the things that you learned from Fritz Von Erich? And Bruiser Brody. And well, Bruiser Brody, he would always tell me, he said, Al, you need to learn how to take care of yourself in the ring because these people, I think that's where I really got it from. Because there's some people, because I was, I, was, I was getting a little bit of a push. And uh, Bruiser told me, he said, you need to learn how to take care of yourself better than what you do. You trust people too much. And when you trust people, he says, that's, that's going to be your downfall. And Brody, let me tell you something, Brody was one heck of a man. He, he took care of himself, and if he liked you, he took care of you. If he didn't like you, he let you know where you stood. Right. I remember him beating up people that climbed out of a cage to get away from Brody. That would be Lex Luger down far. That would be Lex Luger. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I had that on video, actually. <laughs> he so. wanted to tape. I'd like to see that one, too. Were you there the night that happened? Or? No. Uh, okay. 
Um, getting back to Southwest Championship Wrestling, um, Manny Fernandez, he was down there in the territory at the time. The Raging Bull, Manny Fernandez, Raging Bull. If you kept him out of a bar, he was one, he could do just about anything in that ring, and he would. He would do anything. That guy, he can go, he would go. Thoughts on Tully Blanchard, of course, Joe's son. Joe's son, Tully. He was a good guy. He, he had to keep an eye on him too a little bit, but he was more to himself, for himself than anyone else. He wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't up and up. Do you think he was a good wrestler or do you think he was pushed because he was, uh, you know, the son? He was decent. He was decent. He was a good, he was pretty good, but his the dad also helped out a lot. All right. Now, how tight was that locker room? Was it clickish or? No, no. It started falling apart uh, when Joe started losing a little bit. Did things change once uh, Southwest went national with the USA deal? Uh, yeah, they didn't last long as far as television wise. At the time, it wasn't uh, Von Erich that had the uh, uh, cable network. It was Blanchard. Right. And he couldn't he couldn't handle the talent that was needed. And that's when uh, Von Erich took it over. Right. Now, from there, where did you go? Did you go down to Texas? Or, uh, from there, I, like I said, I went to New Zealand and I went to South Africa. After that tour, I went to South Africa. I was there for 10 weeks. <clears throat> Had a great time. And that's when I turned from your so-called good guy into your bad guy. It was only about about two years into the business. Did you like working heel better than face? Or? I love it. All right. I love it. Heel, you go and you pretty much do what you want, say what you want to say. And uh, people just had to respect you for it. And then I earned my respect in the ring from the guys. Now, what year did you go down to Puerto Rico? Because I know you worked down there a lot. I worked back and forth in Puerto Rico for about two years. I think it was uh, 85. What are your thoughts on that territory down there? Before the Bruiser Brody deal, I can I can go down there. I, w I wouldn't mind at all. Horrible place as far as Puerto Rico. Horrible place. Uh, the wrestling talent was there. It was still, in, and it's, from what I hear, it's still pretty much wrestling, like it should be. What are your thoughts on uh, Carlos Colon? I like Carlos. I never had nothing bad against Carlos, but the thing with Carlos is he was your good guy. Bad cop was uh, Gonzalez. Right. And uh, he kept it that way, and he was always the one that he would do the say so, but it's Gonzalez would do the dirty work. Right. Also, uh, working with uh, Invader One, I believe you worked a couple of matches with him. Yeah, Jose Gonzalez. He, right. in the ring, he did business. He was he was a good businessman as far as that goes, and uh, he helped me out a little bit. You know, <clears throat> he told me what I needed to do to make it down in the Puerto Rican style, which he was right and he was truthful about that. But how did you have to change your style? Just a little bit more aggressive. Down in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico likes violence. And the more violence you gave them, that's what they wanted more. And that's what you did. What is your take on the whole entire situation with Bruiser Brody and uh, Jose Gonzalez? Jose Gonzalez killed him. All right. There was no doubt about it. And to me, Carlos Colon knew about it. And he was the one that sent the word into it to Jose to do it. Maybe not to kill him, but to injure him and put him out for good. Do you think it had to do with the fact, I've heard different stories that maybe Brody was a bully back in the day when uh, Jose Gonzalez worked TV for WF, and I, I think it was like the late 70s, and now he had power in the, in the locker room and Brody was a bully? Or um, Brody was never a boy as far as uh, in the ring or business-wise. Brody was never a bully. Brody just took care of business. When Brody got in that ring, Brody did what needed to be done, and he did it. As far as power-wise, yeah, Jose Gonzalez liked the power, and he had the power in there. I wasn't there. I was supposed to be on that tour. Right. And I didn't make that flight. Uh, from what I heard, though, in the, in the in the shower where he got him, Brody didn't slap him. If Brody would have slapped him, Brody would have finished it right there on the spot. He would not have let him left and then come back in. Brody wouldn't have been waiting for him in the shower anyway. Who do you think led to the ball? What have you heard? I never really heard anything. He wanted him to do a job or something, and if it wasn't right, Brody wasn't going to do it. That's why I said it, it, it was planned the first time when he walked in there. All right. Memories of working with uh, Abdul the Butcher, <clears throat> Abby. Abby. Abby's a good guy. He, uh, like I said, there's a lot of characters in this business, and he's <laughs> he's one of the best. As far as a big man like that, 455, 500 pounds, he's, he can move. He can move, and he was... He's there for you all the time. He'd never leave you stranded. Now, I believe you also worked for uh, Bill Watts. Yeah. In the South Territory. Bill Watts. That's where I, I really met Buzz Sawyer. 
Bill Watts was up and up until the end. Bill Watts, as far as business-wise, to me, he was one of the smartest men out there because he knew when it was time to get out, and he did. He stole the territory from a blind man, but <laughs> <laughs> that was McGurk. He stole the territory from him, but he, he knew when to do it. What is he like as a boss and Booker? He had a little bit of an ego, and his, and his kid did too, but he wasn't bad. He, he'd tell you like it was, like what he wanted. And he, he did have the power in the, to back it up, and he did. This kid meaning uh, Eric Watts? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as a booker, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on him as a booker? Do you think he was tough on the guys? Because I heard, you know, he would fine everybody if they were late. Yeah. Like yeah, I never got fined. I, I did my job. I, what I was supposed to do, I did, you know. He made a few promises as far as money-wise, and that's always a big issue when you talk about promoting and booking and stuff like that is money-wise. The money wasn't there, and... I wasn't going to stay around for it. I got my paycheck one day on TV, and I left. By the time I got home, he sent messages to send me back. He gave my guarantee, and I worked through uh, another couple months before I quit again. What was the uh, road schedule like for uh, UWF? That's, that's where uh, you did a lot of travel. You do a lot of travel there. and then That was your 25, 3,000 miles a week. Now, I believe you had a program, I guess, with uh, Wendell Pulley. Or did you actually team with him? You I teamed, teamed with him, right? Yeah, I was teaming with Wendell. And you worked against uh, DBS and Steve Williams yeah. a lot. What was that like? Uh, Wendell, as far as a partner, he wasn't bad. He had an ego. He was a real big ego, and he didn't want to do a lot of things. And I would do it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> that's where Brody taught me, too. He says, you need to take care of yourself better than what you do because promoter doesn't care who's doing the job as long as it gets done. Steve Williams, good guy, hardcore. Ted DiBiase, the same way. Now, I, I think it was when you guys won the belts, you wound up working against uh, Bob Sweetan and Steve Williams instead of DiBiase. Why was that, do you know? Or? Nah, I don't remember why. I don't know why it didn't work that one. As champions, was there pressure on you guys from Bill Watts or less pressure? Uh, Bill Watts had a plan to make us like, uh, can't even think of what the names were. Ricky. Rock and Roll Express. Rock and Roll Express. And at 140, 160 pound guys, 100, 240 can't do what they're doing. The up and down, the flying and stuff, they're going to get that out of uh, 240s and stuff like that. Did he understand that or do you think he still expects you guys? Yeah, to well, no, he understood it, but there was no way we were going to do it. And you don't take <laughs> out the Rock and Roll Express and bring in some two guys that you just threw together and say, hey, that's our new Rock and Roll Express. Right, right. He tried to pull it, but it didn't fly. Thoughts on working with uh, Bill Dundee and Dutch Mantel? <clears throat> I had a few matches with them. I didn't have that many. Dutch Mantel, I met him a few times, I worked with him a few times, but never, never really cared for it. Uh, how about uh, Tom Pritchard? Well, g getting back to Dutch, as far as working with him, you didn't care for him? Or? Yeah, working with him, he had his own style. Everybody's style, he was more of a Tennessee style. Old school, man. Yeah, old school. and. And like I said, I was from the old school, pretty much the old school. But the Tennessee style that, you know, I didn't make it in Tennessee. I, were, I wrestled there one time for uh, Jarrett. Jarrett. And uh, didn't last. What was that like down there? <laughs> you want to talk about your cartoon characters? That's the place to be, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, I got there. I was supposed to have a match with Jerry Lawler. They flew me in just for one shot. Right. I come in there and, and they ended up changing everything in the dressing room. And it was gonna be a tag match. It was me and Star against uh, Jerry Lawler and they didn't say who. When I get to the ring, uh, Star gets to the ring and I do my own thing. I always pace back and forth throughout the ring, my, my low spots, high spots. Here comes Jerry Lawler and I'm, I'm ready to go. And behind him was Freddy Krueger. <laughs> uh, Star took off to the she jump out of the ring Lawler jumped out of the ring Freddy Krueger comes into me and I was like back off uh uh he's hollering get out get out get out I never ran from anybody in the ring but I just ducked out underneath the ropes back off back off well Jerry knew right then that it wasn't gonna fly cause yeah. I'm there to wrestle. To me, it's still a sport, and that's the old school, and that's, that's how I was taught. 
Well, every time I got in the ring, Jerry was in the ring because they wouldn't put us in there. After the match, I don't know, I don't remember the outcome, but after the match, went back to the locker room and there was money being passed around. I forgot who it was that won it, said that I wouldn't do it <laughs> with uh, Kruger and I didn't. So <laughs> one of the boys was a winner of about 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> who was Freddie? That was it uh, Doug Gilbert at the time? Or? Yeah. Okay. yeah, it was Tommy Gilbert. Tommy, okay. <clears throat> uh, Tom Pritchard, you worked with him as well. I worked with Tom Pritchard a few times. I had some good matches with him. Not, uh, he was a good guy to work. He was he was old school. He was a good guy to work with. Now, did things change at all when Eddie Gilbert came into uh, the Watson's territory? Not really. It, it, it was the same. Eddie Gilbert was all right. He he was a good guy too. He he could do a lot too in the ring. He was he was up and up. A little bit smaller guy than me, but. He was up and up in that ring. At like what point in your career did you, you know, have the most success? I'm going to say when I got to the Von Erichs and then with NWA, because I went out uh, when I left the Von Erichs, the WCCW. Right. And went into uh, NWA back then with NWA. Uh, I guess I had a reputation and it, it just followed. It carried through. Now, you went to uh, you went to the Von Erichs after NWA, correct? No, before. That was before. Okay. I guess let's talk about that. You left, well, you left UWF pretty much, I guess, after a couple months you were there, right? Uh, I think I was there like six months. All right. Why did you leave so soon? I uh, just <coughs> couldn't take uh, Grizzly Smith. Grizzly? Yeah. What was he like? He's another snake. His son got the name from him, and it does fit. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> so from there, you went down to Texas for uh, Fritz Von Erich? Yeah. What was that territory like? What was Fritz like? Fritz, it was it was falling at the time. Fritz's territory was falling. All the Von Erichs, Von Erichs, Von Erichs. They actually needed somebody that they could work with about their same size. And that was me. Gary Hart was a booker at the time, and he was also my manager. All right. And uh, I had matches with Brody. And I said before, Brody, if he liked you, he'd have some great matches with you. If he didn't, you didn't have any kind of match with him at all. And I had some great matches with him. Abdullah the Butcher came in there. He was my partner a few times. and. We had we had uh, success. Matter of fact, I think I was uh, one of the last ones on top with Kevin Von Erich to draw over a hundred thousand dollars in uh, Texas Stadium. Before you got there, had you heard any stories about the Von Erichs? Did you give any? I always heard a lot. Of, I heard a lot about the Von Erichs when I was with Joe Blanchard. <clears throat> I never really met him up until I got there. Were the stories good or bad? <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me tell you, Kerry was one heck of a worker. Kerry was pretty good. Kevin was hardcore, just like his dad. And uh, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were. To me, like I said, I got along with all of them. What are your thoughts on the Von Erichs and their personalities outside the ring and their antics? I was, I was, yeah, outside the ring, the Von Erichs. They never left the ring because they they lived and they believed that they were the Von Erichs. And Kevin Von Eric is, I mean, he's still the only one alive, and I, I have respect for that guy. He's hes still up in my books. Do you have any good stories as far as uh, them partying and, you know, the drugs and stuff like that? Uh, there's no good stories about partying like that because they went overboard. When it was time to party, you couldn't party any better than them. Do you have any good stories you'd like to share? We, usually we get a lot of guys <laughs> tell stories on the Von Erichs. So. <laughs> I guess I can't knock the Von Erichs, but I'll tell you, there was one story. I was in the ring with Kevin, and he climbed up on the top rope and do a sunset flip, and he missed me, completely <laughs> missed me. <laughs> and uh, he fell over. Well, in the locker room, he sent a message that somebody must have opened the back door because the wind blew him over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> were they ever hard to work with at any time? <clears throat> um, Business-wise, no, because they were there for business. Kevin was really stiff, but that's that's how he was taught from his dad. Right. And Kerry, Kerry was all business. Was it ever hard to work with him, with Kerry? Because it was no, no. You could never tell Kerry was really hurt. Right. I mean, he limped when it looked like it was part of his walk. Now, also, I guess when they did the uh, heart attack angle with Fritz von Erich, did you find that was tasteless, or did you think it was good yeah. for business? Or no, nah, it was it was it was pretty tasteless. He should never. Fritz von Eric was a legend in Texas, and they should have left it at that. You know, Fritz would never wanted any sympathy from anybody, and they should have left it at, like he was on top.
do you think Fritz capitalized on the son's death for shows? Yeah, he did. Yeah, that was a bad taste that he did, but uh, yeah. Did the fans feel it was back then? Yeah. 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 Thoughts on working with Tony Atlas? <clears throat> Tony was a good worker when he wanted to. I had I had a few matches with him where, you know, I was your champion down there, and I'd hit him, and he would just like shake it off like nothing. And I hit him again, and he'd shake it off like he believed the Superman gimmick. Well, I, I told him I was still going over. I was, it was for the title. I, I don't know if it was for the title or just build it up for the title. And uh, I backed into a corner, and I just stood there, and he hit me. And I just shook it off like like never even touched me. And I told him, I said, if you want this match to go, it'll go, but you better sell this. And I just took my finger and just poked him in the forehead. And he realized what he had done. He just started flopping around like a fish. After that, we had some good matches. Right. Did you have any problems with anybody else ever in the ring? There was one Coco Samoa. I had a problem with it when I first got to Blanchard's territory. I was a new baby face. And I was, I was getting a little push from him. And uh, he ended up kicking me in the jaw and broke my jaw. Uh, I belted it back to him. I hurt him a little bit, but... You know, I was I was when I was always up and up, and he told me on the mat. He said, "We'll finish this outside." I said, "No problem." We finished the match. I went across the dressing room. I said, "Let's go outside." I went outside, and he followed me out and stuck a gun in my stomach. <laughs> and Bob Sweet Tan was there watching, and Eric Emery. I ended up being a roommate with Eric Emery after a while, but he was watching. They were laughing, and I told Coco then. I said, "You got me." I said, "You got me now." Well, they fired him, and he talked to Joe Blanche, and he put us both in the office. I said, I don't have a problem. I said, if you ever get stiff again or anything, I'm going to end it there. I will never take it outside again. And uh, after that, he was like butter. Had some good matches with him. Bob, uh, not Bob Sweetan, Burt Prentice was down there. What was he like? I don't remember Burt. He managed uh, Tully at times. Yeah, see, Tully left. That Tully went to NWA when I had gotten there. Okay. So I never really met him. Going back to uh, Kevin and Curry, um, compare working with them in the ring. Between the two of them? Yeah, between the two of them. Kevin was hard to sell. <clears throat> Kevin, you couldn't, Kevin wouldn't sell your stuff. Right. But Curry would make your stuff look great. Uh, ability, Curry, Curry was smooth. Curry was real smooth and Kevin was rough on the edges. Were you down there at any other times of any other suicides? No. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, well, I just flew in like two days before, or two days after Chris killed himself. What was the mood in the locker room? It was all down. Some of the guys that had been around for a while started making jokes of it. Of you know, tasteless jokes. I never, I never paid attention to them. I didn't, I didn't care for stuff like that. There's some other stories about. Well, we'll probably get into them. Like uh, Sting, Sting and Steve Williams. Like I said, both of them are pretty good guys. Steve Williams, now nah, Sting was the one that started. He'd make fun of the handicap. Here, this is your baby face, your big time baby face at the time, and he'd be making fun of your handicaps, you know. And I, I never thought that was uh, tasteful at all. I, would, I would never wanted to see that stuff from them. All right. Um, Matt Bourne, he was back. Uh, Matt Bourne. I had some Matt Bourne matches that I remember one time we went an hour Broadway. And uh, at the end of it, he had me one, two. I kicked out one, two, and a bell rang at the end of the 60 minutes. And it was in it was in the sportatorium. And everybody started hollering, whoa, shit, whoa. Well, Gary Hart and Matt's father got together and we did another 15 minutes. They agreed another 15 minutes and it was the same finish. One, two, Buzzer rang, time was over, and we had a standing ovation. Matt Bourne, it was 110 degrees inside that building. There was not a dry spot on that mat. <laughs> it was it was soaking wet. Matt Bourne laid there for a while and got up, hugged each other. I went my way, he went his way. We had a standing ovation, and that was probably one of the best matches as far as time-wise that we, we ever had like that. As far as fans, 
Uh, you wrestled a lot of different territories. What were the best fans that appreciated you the most? <clears throat> I made an interview out of Texas, out of Dallas one time. And it was, it was basically it was Gary's idea. You know, the women loved me, the men hated me. It was a Latin heartthrob. Right. And I made an interview one time about I had three or four different women around me at all times. And if I saw found someone pretty, I said, hey, babe, come here. And we went to a restaurant, a little Italian restaurant. And uh, there was no women in there except for the owner. He was a nice looking blonde, so we took her in there and said, well, we'll do this, we'll do that. So he brought the food out, we ate, you know. Guy, lady comes by with a flower and there's a fake rose, you know. Right. So I told her, I said, here, babe. I said, this is for you. And I handed his fake rose. I said, maybe next time you get a real one. Huh. <laughs> you know? So a few minutes later, they come up with a check. But when they gave the check to me, I looked at the guy and I looked at him and said, here, use your credit card, baby. We'll use the cash. We'll spend the cash later. My dad saw that interview. And my dad started telling everybody, he said, I taught my son better than that. I taught my son. <laughs> my dad was a believer. And, right. uh, <laughs> Memories working with a, a very young Mick Foley back then, Cactus Jack. Ooh, Cactus Jack. Yeah, he, at the time, he wasn't a flyer like he turned out to be. Uh, he, he pretty much do anything in that ring, too. And it showed later. I feel sorry for him about now. Because now is when all of them bumps take effect. Right. Um, I guess USWA started, that, that took over for World Class. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that situation? <clears throat> it didn't last long. They flew me in there because, like I said, I was probably one of the last ones to draw $100,000 in uh, Texas Stadium. But they took me in there and they put over the Patriot. And uh, Bob Eady was a booker, I believe. Or Eden, somehow. He was, he was a booker. And he asked me to do it. And I did. I did. And they wanted it clean. Well, first time Eddie Gilbert had a little interference and it wasn't what they wanted, so I redid it. I did it again. Now, Terry Taylor, did you have a lot of heat with uh, Terry Taylor? No, outside? I didn't have any heat with Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor, to me, there's, I'm going to say 10 of the, probably the best. I'm going to include myself in that. Terry Taylor was one of the tops. There was never any problems with you guys? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not that I knew of. What are your memories of working with uh, Eddie or uh, Eric Embry as a booker? Eric wasn't bad. He was he was young and learning about the booking situation. Uh, he wasn't too bad as far as a booker wise. He he tried to follow some of the old school methods. And when you're a booker and you're working too, you're trying to take care of number one. All right. Do you think that interfered? No. He Eric never interfered with me. Like I said, Fritz von Eric liked me, and and I was Fritz's champion. When Jerry Lawler came into the territory, how did guys treat him? <clears throat> and how did he treat the guys? Jerry never, Nino, to me, no, Jerry never treated anybody any different. Jerry was Jerry. He didn't care who was around. He would treat everybody the same. And he never had, not, I mean, not that I noticed any eagles from him, but he never treated anybody different. When he came in, did you see anybody like as a threat? Like as far as maybe Jerry, that maybe your push as a top guy would be over? Or? Uh, no, nah. because at the time Ken Mantell took over the book when uh, Jerry came in. So I knew they had their own crew, and I talked to Fritz already. And I told Fritz, I said, when it's time, I said, you let me know, because the only one I'm going to put over is Von Eric. Right. And I did. What do you think World Class did wrong that caused it to go down? I think it was too much television. I don't think they did anything wrong, but they needed to, they needed to change out their talent more than what they did. Fritz, to me, Fritz was like, if you were in with Fritz, you stayed there for, for years. And to keep a territory alive, you got to rotate your talent. You rotate your talent. What happened with Fritz's stuff was there was too much television going on with WWF, NWA, their TV, and all the cable networks coming through. That's what killed Fritz. You think it just went stale, the product? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are your uh, memories of working with Michael Hayes? I only had a few matches with Michael Hayes. He, he was more of a gimmick, but he was, he was good. He was okay. There was nothing wrong with Mike. How about uh, Chris Adams? Chris Adams goes in one of the top ten. Like I said, it was it was a few of them that I had a lot of respect for. And Chris Adams was one. He would do anything and <clears throat> and get the job done. What was he like outside the ring? I never socialized with him a bunch outside the ring. In the dressing room, he was always laughing. He was a character there, but he uh, 
he went his own way. I never socialized with uh, most of them guys anyway. Now, after uh, World Class, you went on to NWA. Yeah. How did you make that transfer? <clears throat> that was with Gary Hart. I just put over Kevin Von Erich for the world title out of, out of World Class, and we were going into uh, the NWA. And the transaction, it was it's a bigger territory. You know, at the time, Crockett had a lot of guys. I walked in the dressing room, I was like, man, what am I doing in here, you know? And they had some they had some pretty big boys, and it was, it was a A1 show. What are your uh, thoughts and memories of uh, Jim Crockett as a promoter? Jim was a good guy. He he had his uh, his ways, and he, he got suckered in by Watts. As far as for buying out a territory that he didn't have to buy, he would have just moved right in and taken it. But uh, Jay respected the guy, and he gave him his money for it, and that was it. What are your thoughts on Dusty Rhodes? Because he was at the Booker at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Dusty was good. Dusty took care of me up to the end when he made it. He wanted to reopen Florida <clears throat> and always said what I want to do when I get ready to retire or end my career. I wanted to run Florida as my last territory. And I worked for Dusty over in NWA when they made the transaction to WCW when Dusty was on his way out. That's about the time I was on my way out because when I forgot, the, I think it was uh, I forgot the new booker that came in and it was Flair had an ear on it. And Dusty was leaving, and I said, well, I said, what do you see for me? I told a new booker in Crockett and uh, Turner, I said, what do you see with me? And he says, I see something, but can you do the, the super fly? I forgot what the booker's name was, and I told him, I said, you know what? I said, in that ring, I can do anything. The super fly is Jimmy. I said, you got two weeks give you my two week notice now. You got two weeks to come up with something or I'm out. Right. And uh, I gave him my two week notice right then. And he came up to me in St. Pete. I did a few, and that's when Flair had his ear too. <clears throat> and I told, uh, I had a deal with Flair. I put him over anywhere cause I knew we were going back to Florida. So I'll put you over anywhere you want. In Florida, I'm not putting you over. And uh, we, we worked on an agreement. We had a WDQ. So we go to Broadway, and uh, the night at St. Pete, Booker come up and said, how do you think that my world champion beating you is going to hurt you? He's beaten everybody. I said, it's not going to hurt me. He said, well, good, then you'll do the job. I said, no, it's not going to hurt me because I'm not doing the job. And they put Eddie Gilbert in to fill my place, and it took him 45 minutes to get the match started because the fans didn't want to see Eddie Gilbert. They wanted to see me a hometown boy. What was your reason for not wanting to do the job? Just because? Um, that was the agreement I had with Flair. Right. And he agreed with it. Now the booker's going to come in there and say, no, I want this. And, and that night I told whoever it was that the booker was, I told him, you'll be here for six weeks and you'll be gone. And I think he only lasted four. Huh. So. Do you think Flair just agreed to your face and then went behind your back? Sure he did. I'm sure he did. Flair's a good guy. But he's one that you really got to keep an eye on. And that's why he stays on top as long as he does. And that's why he's still in there now. Because he's learned to take care of himself. And there's, there is no number one and a half. It's Flair and that's it. Now, how did you originally get paired with? I know Gary Hart was down in world class. Whose idea was to bring you in with Gary <clears throat> up there as a mouthpiece? Uh, Gary. Gary was the one. He just taken over the book there. And he, he brought me in. He said... Uh, I'm the new booker here, and it was Brody. Brody was there at the time, too. He said, and I'm your manager. You have a problem with that? I said, no. And Gary started the ball rolling. And NWA, you were with him, too. Um, what was he like outside during Gary Hart? Gary liked a little bit of a booze. Cognac was his thing. Huh. He wasn't a bad guy. He stayed to himself. He was pretty quiet. All right. But he he was he was a good man. He was a family man at the time, too. He was, he was a pretty good guy. Now, you were in a program with uh, Nikita Kola for a while. Yeah. What was Nikita like to work yeah. with? He had his good days and bad days. He was a little uncoordinated at times. And he, I mean, he broke my nose one of the first times I had my nose broken. It was from him. It just one of these spur of the moments. Where he just, boom, he just pop up with an elbow. And it was always somebody else's fault. It was never his fault. Right. But he was he was good. He would, <clears throat> if he had confidence in you, he could do anything with him. And he would, he would go with it. And he also worked with Eddie Gilbert. Again, in the NWA. 
Yeah, a few times, a few mm -hmm. times with Eddie Guerrero. He wasn't, he wasn't bad. I like working with Eddie. Did he change a lot from uh, earlier? Time? No, Same I don't think so. Same Eddie. Also, you worked with the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton and uh, Tommy Rogers. Yeah. Bobby Fulton was good. Tommy Roger had a little bit of a chip, a big chip on his shoulder, but like I, I had no problem with either one of them. One time we did have words, and I just let them know that you know, I'm 240 pounds compared to your 180. If you want to go, let me know. Right. Because we'll go, and it was it was ended pretty quick. No, after your program with the Kid, I guess that, that was the thing with you and Flair, right? Because you seemed yeah, you know, yeah. Right down. Yeah, I hadn't been beaten. Right. I was never beaten with uh, NWA at the time. And that's where Flair had his say so because I was the only one left. Because Flair went through everybody except for me. And that's where Dusty was the one that actually took care of me because maybe Dusty had plans. I was told he had plans. Right. Did they promise you anything when you first got there? There was no promises, but it was said, it was so called that I was supposed to be the next world champ. And uh, that's why I think Dusty took care of me on that. I worked, I worked a couple of programs and I think the longest one was uh, Nikita. And when it was time to do a job for Nikita, I did. I did my job for him. I said, there was no, never really lost any matches on television because that was your buildup. You know, now you lose them in a house show, you let these people pay to see you get beat. Now everything is done on TV. Also, you worked with Sting. Uh, what was he like to work with in the ring? <clears throat> All ego. Um, he uh, he wasn't bad. He could do pretty much anything in the ring. He he would move, but he he drew a line. I think that came from Dusty. You know, you don't do this, you don't do that. It was a match I had with Nikita, where uh, Gary and I left Nikita laying in the middle of the ring, and Dusty sent Sting in to make the big save. Well, like I said, I never backed down from anybody. When Sting hit the ring. He confronted me. I mean, he committed himself in in my zone. And I just looked at him and I said, you got a problem. Because I've never ran from anybody. I never backed down from anybody. And he's hollering, you get out of here. I said, no. I said, you get out of here. And the key was laying between us. And I'll never forget, Gary Hart just put his hand on Sting, put his hand on me, and that was it. And I just backed out and walked out of the ring. <clears throat> Sting went back to the dressing room and complained to Dusty. Dusty, Dusty, he started crying almost. Dusty, Dusty, Al didn't leave the ring. And Dusty told us, well, next time take a chair in there with you, because then I have a reason to scoop. And uh, that next time never came up. <laughs> uh, you think Sting was like that because they were giving him a big push at the time, or do you think he was just, that was his personality? Uh, they were giving him a big push. <clears throat> Let's go back a little bit. Sting never sold tickets. Sting sold pictures. Back in my day, you had picture sellers and you had ticket sellers. Sting was a picture seller who thought he was selling tickets. So the Eagle came in, yeah, they were giving a big push. He wasn't going anywhere with it because at the time it was a ticket seller that they wanted, not pictures. That's when all the color started. It was Sting and the Warriors. Now the Warriors sell tickets because of their look, and they they beat up people, you know. But uh, Sting was basically there for a ticket seller at the time. I mean, uh, sorry, a picture seller at the time. What are your thoughts on the locker room at the time? <clears throat> In between the transition of bookers and owners and everything, it was it was you could cut it with a knife pretty easy. It was it was thick. Then you had a lot of egos coming through too, Luger, Sting. Steve William was there, uh, <clears throat> Flair, Four Horsemen. I was gonna ask you, did it, anybody's egos get to their head? Everybody knew their place though. Everybody was hoping for a different spot if they weren't happy, but everybody knew their place when they got in there. Were you there when Tully and Orin left? Yeah. What was it like then? Did it change at all? Uh, it was time for them to leave, or it was time for Arn, uh, uh, Tully to leave. <clears throat> because uh, he he was he was a weak link on that. It was time for them to go. Four horses were already wore out, <clears throat> and uh, he needed a change. Call it, you could call it anything else, and kept the same four guys or three of the guys, 
with a different gimmick or a different look, and it might have gone good. How big were drugs in the locker room at the time? In the locker room, there was no, I didn't see any drugs. Now, I've I seen a couple of, you know, you just turn your head a couple of times, you know, but I remember one guy, I'll never mention names, on an off cycle, he was taking eight cc's every other day on an off cycle. He was trying to get up to 350 pounds and he uh, was probably about 315, 320. But other than that, no. What are your thoughts on steroids? Back in my day, all I ever took was a DECA because the amount of traveling that we did, <clears throat> you couldn't eat right, you couldn't hit the gym right. Uh, and that's the only drug I did. And I took one CC every 10 to 12 days just to maintain the look that I had. Right. And back then you had to have, if you had a look, you had to keep that look and you have to do whatever it did, whatever it took. And my thing was DECA. I would take a little bit of DECA every 10, 12 days, one CC. And uh, that was it. When I got to WWF, the drugs were around there a lot. Right. That whole story, and I don't know if I should mention. You can. <laughs> that whole story with the Hogan and Vince right. and all that, it was true. Vince, is, had, Vince had his doctor in there, and he prescribed you any drug you wanted. And Vince knew it. And that's why I don't know, understand why uh, he keeps taking Hogan back every time they try to open up a new territory. Hogan runs back to Vince. Oh, Vince, Vince. Mm -hmm. To me, that was the worst territory I ever worked. I'm going to ask you about that. Um, I guess when you were told that you're going to work the Tower of Doom match, what was your initial thoughts? Oh, I couldn't <laughs> even tell you. I was so <laughs> far back. <laughs> what are your memories of the match itself? Do you remember the match? No. Do you remember? Was it three cages? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin Sullivan yeah. was Bob. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Too as far as fear of it, no, it was it was no big deal. I didn't even know who won that match. I don't remember either. It was Jimmy Garvin, Jimmy Garvin yeah. got crushed. Well, <laughs> she was in the final cage. Yeah. Now it it wasn't a hard match to work anyway. You know, ones I didn't really care for the ones that you see on on your show, the ECW. Uh, <laughs> How did you wind up going to Titan to the WWE? <clears throat> my wife sent in. My wife sent in the. Uh, the tape, they required a tape. And at the time I was still with uh, WCW. And I was starting to leave them and go into Florida. My wife sent a tape in and they called me up. I got home, I was home four days a month. Right. And uh, Vince had his secretary, somebody call up and send me a ticket and everything and I went up. And that's how I started. Uh, as far as territory wise, I'm funny about it. Uh, Vince had his own group and uh, it didn't matter to me if you didn't have if you didn't have a spot for somebody you should have left them alone left them alone because I was always not always but I, I'd been on top and I was staying on top I had done my jobs and everything and uh, <clears throat> I didn't have a problem when I got there Vince and his right hand man and left hand man they act like they didn't know who I was. So I, I had no big deal. George Napolitano printed one time in one of his magazines that Perez going to the WWF, will he be able to take the games that they play? Were you excited about going there or was it just another company? No. No. I didn't, I didn't really want to go over there. But my wife said, you know, it's about time you go. So I did. I went, um, I'll tell you how that ended. If you want to get into that real quick. Yeah, you can, you can talk about that. Uh, I think I've been there a couple, three months at the time. Never did her TV. One of Vince's right-hand men came up to me, married to a man. And Is he's Patterson. Patterson. He was sitting at the end of an eight-foot table up against the wall. <clears throat> and I remember I never, I never played games. I'm in there. I'm there for my business. Well, Pat Patterson pulls me aside. and says, oh, come here. Let's talk, French Canadian. Let's talk. Let's talk. So he's sitting up against the wall, eight foot table this way, and I got my leg propped up on the table. And he says, you know, it's so good to have you here. You're going to make a lot of money. We'll give you a new gimmick. The Latin heart, there's too many of those here. We'll do this. We'll put you on our TV. You'll be a big superstar. The buildup, man, I'm about a five minute buildup. Then he tells me, besides that, here you go both ways. 
I said I never play games. I told him, F no, I kicked the table over. He went tumbling down. No, no, no. I'm talking bad guy, good guy. What'd you think I meant? <laughs> About three weeks after that, Vince comes up to me and says, you know, Al, I know you're having a hard time. I said, no, I'm not having a hard time. He said, well, nobody knows who you are. I said, Vince, nobody knows who I am. Every time I walk out to the ring, even in New York, they're hollering, Latin heartthrob, where's Gary Hart? And Kerry Von Eric's gonna kick your ass. <laughs> but nobody knows who I am. He said, well, it's different than the New York crowd. I said, so for, for the New York crowd, Al Perez, Latin heartthrob's a piece of shit, right? He goes, no, no, no. I said, I must be. He said, well, if you want to put it that way, yeah, but when we get you on the TV, you'll be all right. I said, okay. The next day, he pulls me aside and says, Al, we're looking for somebody who's over, good enough to make the ultimate warrior look good. I said, me? He said, yeah, you'd be perfect. I said, yesterday I was a piece of shit to the WWF crowd. Today I'm over enough good to make them look good? He said, yeah. I said, you got the wrong guy. I said, I'll do my job if I have to. Uh, a job is a right. job but uh, you're not gonna take me into a territory and just smash me because I'm not gonna play Pat Patterson's game. I was at a hotel with about six other guys, six, eight guys waiting to check in, no names mentioned. One guy's at the counter and the lady asked him, one better two. He said, uh, two. And from behind me, Pat Patterson said, one better be fine. And the guy said, one bed. Wow. So I, I, I didn't belong in that territory. Top guy? Was it a top guy? Or? No. No. Okay. Um, the, when you first got into the World Wrestling Federation, did Vince make any promises at all? I and mean, like, what your initial impressions were? Vince, were? that was the only time Vince ever talked to me, wow. was when he pretty much called me a piece of crap. <laughs> so you had no idea like what they were going to do with you? Just no. Mm -hmm. the best. That's what I'm saying. If, if he didn't have a spot for me, they should have just left me home. Vince wanted to tie up every piece of talent he could, because that's limiting his competition. Right. How different was the locker room from WCW's locker room? You talk about eagles, you talk about uh, chaos, you talk about people not getting along. That's the place. What did I you see? What did I see there? Everybody's waiting for somebody to fall so they can take their spot. And pretty much everybody there is doing what they have to do to take a spot. I've seen people pretty much want to push somebody down the stairs just to have that spot open. And that's how it was. Vince, I don't think Vince ever promised anybody anything that I know of. Right. But uh, if you weren't his boy, you weren't going to get anything. He had, his, he had his view and that was it. So it was very clickish too at the time. Very. What about Hulk Hogan? What was he like? And what was your interaction with uh, Hulk? I don't care for Hogan. I never have. To me, he's done this this business a lot, but he's also hurt it to me more than what he's helped it. In what Hogan, aspects? It used to be a sport. How can you have a, a non-athletic person in a sport as wrestling was supposed to be a tough sport, all he could do was play the guitar. And uh, now they got him as a top spot, which like, let me tell you something, he's made a lot of people a lot of money. He's also made a lot of money himself, but he's taken a lot of people out of it. A lot of your athletes have been taken out because they're not colorful. And that's all uh, Hogan, and not really Hogan's fault, it's Vince's fault. He took Hogan and made him a superstar Gave him a beautiful gimmick, and he'd done wonders with it. But uh, he, he hurt the wrestling business. Do you blame him, though, for making all the money? I mean, if you were... No. No, you can't blame him. I just never liked him anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How hard was the travel uh, in the World Wrestling Federation? We've heard a lot of horror stories. I used to get 10, 15 <laughs> books of tickets. And one day you'd be in Florida, the next day you'd be in Canada, the next day you'd be in California, the next day you'd be in New York. So you never really knew where you were at. Was it hard adjusting to the new travel schedule? 
and how did you adjust to it? Uh, I was pretty much used to the travel. You know, he just go by his his plan. He had it was pretty easy laid out. Vince had, I believe it was Terry Garvin, a travel agent, <coughs> who had everything laid out. I mean, all you had to do was just be at the airport. The hardest part was finding a ride because you, you had to hook up with somebody and you had to be with somebody two or three days. You'd get a rental car and today you'd be with one guy and the next day you'd be with somebody else. You didn't know and so you try to set up everything on TV because that's the only time you saw the whole crew. Who did you travel with? Uh, I'll tell you what, one of the guys I was, I used to travel with Barry Horwich a little bit. Uh, another good one, a good one was Tito Santana. Anytime he came up to the New York, New Jersey area, I hung out with Tito, and that was my opponent. Another one that nobody really traveled with, except for me, was Randy Savage. I made a few trips to Chicago with Randy. So uh, he, he was pretty good. Why didn't people travel with him? <clears throat> Randy, no, no. Randy didn't want to travel with anybody. Randy knew the best way to make it there was stay by yourself, and he did. I had matches with Randy in Puerto Rico, and uh, we got along good, and I made a couple of road trips with him up in uh, WWF. But uh, you, you stayed to yourself, dude. That was the best way to do it. A lot of people said he was a lot of, he was really paranoid with Elizabeth and stuff like that, and you would lock her away. Yeah, boys. He, he, he did. Uh, I locked my, my wife away from the boys, too. You know, because it's, it's a doggy dog world out there. And for one thing, I would never put my wife in the limelight like that. Right. Ultimate, in, in a sport like that. Ultimate Warrior, what was he like in our... Jim was a good guy. He he couldn't do a whole bunch. That's why his matches with WWF were real short, because he couldn't do a whole bunch. When him and Sting teamed up together before he, they turned him to the Ultimate Warrior. Right. Was the Blade he, Runners. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was the weak link there as far as ability. But he looked like a million dollars, and that's the push he got. Outside the ring, was he? Jim was a good guy. Yeah. I like Jim. Yeah. Um, after I guess while you were there, who was your favorite guys to work with in Titan? <clears throat> My top ten, most of them were there, but most of them were from before. To me, the best of the best was Terry Taylor. Uh, as your heel. I'd call my own matches. When I worked with Terry, I called it, and I let him call it too. Terry had some beautiful spots. Terry was one heck of a worker. Uh, Terry, Tito Santana, Tito was all ears. Whatever you wanted to do, Tito was there, and he would do it. Tito trusted me, and I trusted Tito. I tore the cartilage in my knee in a match with Tito. I jumped out of the ring, and I. Vince had his mats about three inches on, away from the apron when I hit that corner and tore my cartilage my knee. And I couldn't walk. I limped around my knee, my knee, my knee. I was hollering. Tito threw me back in, worked my knee. We went home right then, never hurt me at all. So I, I, I liked Tito. I had good matches with Tito and Terry Taylor. Everybody else, I, I couldn't work with. I'm one, I couldn't do the same matches. Another thing, Vince McMahon, programs everything. You don't change anything when you work for Vince. I, I couldn't do the same match six weeks in a row in different parts of the country. I couldn't do it. I'd, I'd get bored with it. And uh, I'd work with the same guy six, seven weeks in every day. Every, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, I was getting stale. I, I didn't want to. Right. I wasn't having fun. I used to love this sport and I still do. But Vince, when I went to WWF, that pretty much killed me because everything was a routine. Don't change this, don't change that. Another thing with Vince, he, Vince, like I said, Vince never talked to anybody, but he had his agents. Um, I used to drop a knee, <clears throat> oh, big knee. Agent came up to me and said, Al, Vince doesn't want you to do the knee drop anymore because uh, Hogan drops a leg for a finish and your leg, your knee looks better than his leg, so don't do it anymore. I said, okay. Next thing was Tito. I used to throw my big elbow off the rope. Agent came up to me and said, Al, Vince doesn't want you to throw an elbow anymore because Tito uses it for a finish <coughs> and yours looks better than his. Okay, so now I can't throw an elbow. 
Um, another one was a neck breaker. I used to throw a great neck breaker. Agent came up to me and said, Al, don't throw a neck breaker. I forgot who was doing the neck breaker at the time. Hong but Kong. yeah, don't throw a neck breaker anymore because so and so uses it for a finish mm -hmm. and yours looks better than him. So I, I snapped at that time. I told him, what am I supposed to do? Just stand in the middle of the ring? <laughs> I said, it's not my fault. They can't do it. Right. It's their fault. If that's what they use for a finish, then they better perfect it or get it, get something different. So I had I had heat there. And I think all the agents were like just waiting for me to screw up a little bit because they wanted to get on me. Right. Uh, one of them come up and told me, Sal, do you have a jacket? I said, it's not cold. He said, no, we're looking for color. We need to do some color. I said, what am I gonna wear a jacket for? I said, when I take it off, you see this, this is it. Why do I need color? You want color? Get a bird. Right. <laughs> and he came over, Coco Beware. <laughs> um, what led you to leaving the WWF? Well, after I had that conversation with Vince about putting uh, the Ultimate Warrior up in a five second match, he shouldn't have taken me in there if he didn't have a spot for me. And the way I've always done business is if you bring me in, you use me, if you don't use me, they let me go the same way I came in, which was clean. And after I told Vince, you got the wrong guy, I think I lasted there about two more weeks until I used up my book of tickets. And he pretty much said, uh, Al, uh, well, we don't really need you. And I told him, I said, well, Vince, I don't really need to be here anyway. So that was pretty much it. What did you plan on doing at that point? I know Dusty was down in Florida. <clears throat> yeah, Dusty was down in Florida. Uh, I was going to work Florida a little bit. And I was pretty much trying to get out of it. You know, I was going to do spot shows here and there, and I was going to do Japan. So the last uh, year in the business, I started doing mostly Japan. What was Florida like as far as Dusty's promotion? Dusty, I think it could have gone good, but Dusty was trying to get back at Vince. And he was worried about that, or trying to get back in with Vince. Right. You know, so I think he was worried about that. So Dusty pretty much killed it himself. DDP was down there at the time. What do you remember about Diamond Dallas Page? I don't think he was working at the time. I think he was just doing he was, announcing. He was, he was announcing, right. yeah. That was all he was doing. He wasn't much of a worker. He always had some beautiful women. That's how he got in with Dusty. Right. The beautiful women come in, Dusty, Dusty, Dusty. And that's how Diamond Dallas Page started out. Real quick, back to the WWF for a second. Were you there when Dusty was there? Yeah. What was... What was that? What was Dusty's take on <clears throat> what they were having him do there? Let me tell you, Dusty could take any gimmick and make it work. And he knew Vince was trying to deface him. him. He was going to stick it to him. And Dusty made that gimmick work. And his charisma, and if you recall, Dusty got it from a black guy, the gimmick. Right. Which I forgot his name, but... Uh, Rufus R. Jones. He got all that from Rufus R. Jones and then fired him out of Florida <laughs> and took over, <laughs> took over what the charisma he had and what he wanted. Um, how did your brother get involved in the business? Cousin. Who was your cousin? Cousin. Yeah, Lou used to watch me a little bit and then figure, well, you know, let me give him a try. So I think he contacted Malenko too and, and he went on. It was one time uh, I was on the road. I think I was out of Dallas at the time and they were running spot shows in Florida. And he asked, my cousin asked me if I could come in and work a tag match with him. I said, yeah. Well, he was your baby face and I've always been your heel. Right. So they brought me in and tried to make me a baby face overnight. And <laughs> I think I made it up to the first step on the ring apron and I turned heel again. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to him? <clears throat> he retired. He got out right after I did. Right. And he's opened up a chiropractic clinic now. Huh. Were you hard on him when he got into the business? Or? No. Nah. He pretty much wanted to do what everyone wanted to do. Go ahead, you know. Thoughts on Mike Graham? If you had a series with him down there in Florida. Uh, Mike Graham was a good guy. I like Mike. He was, he was okay. I had no nothing bad against him to say. One time uh, somebody owed me some money when it hit, out of his office. And I flew from Dallas. My money wasn't home. It was supposed to be home. About three days later, four days later, I flew home from Dallas and went to the office. And this guy who owed me money was in the office. And I confirmed him. I said, I want my money. Well, he was on the phone. So I waited at the door for about 10 minutes while he was talking on the phone. 
you could tell he wanted to get off the phone or the guy wanted to get off the phone, but he wanted to stay on. Right. So uh, he finally got off and he said, oh, what are you doing home? I said, I want my money now. And he said, well, I don't have it. I said, well, this is part of being a promoter. You want to be a promoter? I said, this is the part that you're going to learn quick today. I said, I want my money. I'm going to throw you out the window. We were in a two-story building. And we're upstairs and he, when I reached over to grab him, he started hollering, Mike, Mike. Mike was in the office next door and Mike come running out. He said, Al, what's the problem? I said, well, this guy owed me a little bit of money. And he said, Al, I'll give you the money. I said, no, Mike, it's not the principal. I mean, it's not the money, it's just the principal right now, you know. Uh, he said, he wants to be a big time promoter. I said, well, this is part of the promotion. He said, Al, here, man, he, he gave me the money that he owed me. I said, Wayne, he said, you want to be a big shot? Keep this in mind. You don't pay your bills, they're coming after you. I said, this isn't like a real restaurant business. Right. I said, you screw somebody over, you're going to get it. And I don't know if he kept it in mind or not. Who was Wayne? Wayne Coulter. Oh. He, uh, I think he's still running little shows somewhere down the islands or something. Did you used to do the Bahamas tour? Mm -hmm. With uh, Carrie Bonner, Jimmy Garvin mm -hmm. was on that tour. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. okay. had a good time there. You Carrie. Know, yeah, Carrie was there too. You know Scott Goldstein? I don't remember. Okay, he was just a fan who went down with Jimmy. All right. Um, going back to, I lost track. <laughs> Where were we? Florida. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Dustin Rhodes, what was he like? Dustin wasn't bad. He made fun of me one day because I was in Atlanta of uh, NWA. I'd go out there and I'd run occasionally. I felt like I had to run, I would run. He come driving by me one day and said, ow, it's a work, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, nothing. I said, wait till I get you in the ring. <laughs> and I pretty much blew him up that night. And the next day he was outside waiting for me to go run. That's great. <laughs> you know, so he, Dustin was a, wasn't a bad guy. He had a lot of push. After that territory went under, where did you end up? Just on the indie scene? Yeah. And Japan? Yeah. And I know uh, Joe Bloodheart brought you up in Philadelphia mm -hmm. for TWA when you worked a tag match, I believe. What are your memories of that? I think it was you and uh, Austin Idol against Kevin and uh, Chris Adams? Yeah, I believe so. Eh, it wasn't bad. Uh, Austin Idol was a strong believer in his gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> he was Austin Idol, boy. It wasn't a bad match. We had some, had some good times with him. Was he hard to work with at all? Austin? Yeah. He was limited to his ability to. You know, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't up and up at all. Hmm. But I knew him from Florida. Right. Uh, your thoughts on Joe Petticino and Global? Global, I don't quite remember Global all that much. That was down in uh, Texas. I think that might have been the Patriot. Oh, that was at the Global. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he. Uh, he didn't. I know he didn't last long at all. Texas was funny. If you didn't have what Texas wanted to see, they weren't going to be there for you. And they tried to change the whole floor plan from what the Von Erichs had done for years and years. And these people, they know it's a work, they know it's fake, they know this and they know that. But they had their stars and they believed in certain people. And if you didn't put them people out there, they didn't care who was there. Were those people mostly the Von Erichs? Most of the people were Von Erichs. Another good one was Bruiser Brody, Abdullah the Butcher. Um, Freebirds? Free uh, Freebirds. They believed in the Freebirds a lot. They liked them. And they disliked them. If they liked bad baby face or heel, it didn't matter. Right. They wanted to see you get beat up as a heel. They were there to see it. If not, they didn't care. <clears throat> Remember he was working with uh, the Patriot Doubles. Yeah, he was, he was not bad. He was un unorthodox because he was left-handed. Right. He wasn't bad. He was, he was a pretty good guy. How about Terry Gordy? Terry Gordy was the, one of the easiest guys to work with. I mean, almost 300 pounds, and you never felt them. Now, I've also, Raven was just breaking into the business around the time. Scott Levy. Scotty the Body. Scott. Oh, yeah, Scott, Scott, Scott yeah, down. Scotty the Body, yeah. He, yeah, at the time, he was a little bit stiff. Too much right. bulk and out of the brain. <laughs> <laughs> what about Marcus Dagua? I don't remember Marcus that much. Who did he go at? Handsome Stranger, I think, maybe back then. Yeah, he wore a mask mm -hmm. and did, like, a gimmick with the girls that were inside. Oh, I don't well. remember. No. How about Doug Gilbert? Was he, uh, what was he like outside the ring? 
Uh, I only ran into Doug a couple of times in there. Never, never really socialized with him or anything, so I couldn't say a whole bunch. And the Soul Taker, he was down there. Who knows? The Godfather. Yeah, he, uh, the big boy, he, he was just starting out back then. I thought he would make it a lot bigger than what he did. Uh, like I said, I don't, I don't follow it now, and I don't know what he's doing now. But he had a, he had a great look for the business. Now, how did you wind up going over to All Japan? <laughs> we were in Puerto Rico, and uh, Baba came in, Giant Baba came in. And uh, he uh, had a match set up with him. I was supposed to have a match. And Gonzalez was the book at the time, and I was supposed to go over. I was going to beat Giant Baba because I was getting a big push down there too. And uh, Abdullah come up to me. And this, I'm in a ring in the Bayamon. I'm in a ring and he's telling me, Al, don't beat him. Don't beat him. It'll hurt you if you beat him. Don't beat him. I'm saying, I don't care who this guy is. I'm not going to. And Dory Funk Jr. come up to me and said, he's saying, Al, don't do it. If you start beating him, we're gonna make a, I'm gonna have a big run and you're not gonna beat him. This is my boss, because they make big money when they go to Japan. So I didn't beat him. And he ended up booking me in uh, Japan. Your thoughts on the different style between the United States? And big time different. You know, here, it's a work. Over there, it's a shoe. <clears throat> I work with anybody, but over there, you know, it, it's a business, but over there, they're more like a power play. If they can, I had a guy one time, my airplane spun him and threw him down and I turned around and worked the people and he jumped up, started beating me like it never happened. So I threw him over the top rope. I think he hit the floor and come right back into the same thing, a <laughs> young guy, you know, young boy. And uh, the third time he came back in, I called him and I threw him, I think I threw him three rows deep. And I heard him, and I told him I'll stay out there, and he finally did because I think I really hurt him bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they fight for, for position in Japan. How about uh, Jun Akiyama? Akiyama, what was he like to work with? I couldn't remember his name. It was the bunch that I worked with. You also worked with Sawa over there. Horrible. Okay, one was green boots and one was yellow right. boots. Green yellow boots. Masala, yellow Masala was a good Kawada. guy. He was he was easy. He was a good guy to work with. Kawada's I heard was. It? The yeah, Kawada, let me tell you something. He, what a piece of garbage. He wanted that top spot so bad that he would he would try to beat up Stan. Stan Hansen and Stan practically beat him to death. Huh. Steve Williams did the same thing. These guys, they would beat him to death. He would be right back. I remember one time his face was all blown up from a whipping that he took. But he wanted that, that spot, you know. Did you enjoy working over there? Not one little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what was the locker room like? Was it clickish at all? Or? Uh, well, you pretty much had all the Americans in one in one locker room, one bus. When you got in a bus, you made a trip. It'd take you overnight. Next morning, you're still traveling in a bus. I mean, you had hard miles. Um, the, the locker room there, you know, you had your top guys. Everybody knew their spot. You know, I was just coming in. I was underneath. I do my jobs. I didn't care, you know. Right. After Japan, where did you end up? That's about the time I got hurt. After Japan, uh, I think I was working at a little spot show down in Texas or somewhere around there. And just a little click in my elbow. Matter of fact, Gary Hart started doing some tapes out of uh, Dallas. I forgot what it was called. And he took me back into there and I ended up tearing my bicep. So I had a surgery on my bicep, <clears throat> reattached it. And I was working with somebody in there and ended up hurting my elbow. I had a ball, my bursar sack was all inflamed and couldn't couldn't get rid of it. I had about, about six months, it was in bad shape. So I went to a doctor and tried to, you know, get rid of it. I had about three months of treatment, nothing worked. So he tells me, so that we just go in there, remove it. Some simple surgery, no problem, you know. So I did that, <clears throat> the surgery the first time. Uh, about two weeks later, no, 10 days later, they took out the sutures and uh, it was still swollen. It was, my elbow looked like about the size of a baseball. 
He said, well, it's just the healing process. So he drained it more, give it some more time. Then he took out the stitch and he tells my, my wife, he can go back to the gym, he's okay. My wife says, what? Tell him to go to the gym, you know, you can't do that. Oh yeah, he tells me, let pain be my guide. Well, in, in my business, you don't really know what pain is because right. you, you will go through it every day. Well, I went back to the gym and started working out again and ended up tearing my tricep. So I had to go back into surgery. He ended up re-tearing the whole tricep, just tearing the whole tricep loose so he could justify repair. So he went in there, he repaired it. Couldn't move my arm at all. That was the second surgery. The third surgery, after they take out the suture, the stitches again, it looked like a grapefruit. And I had fluid draining from a closed in stitches where the stitches were. And there was a doctor in the arm. My son plays baseball. So there's a doctor in the stands. He tells me, Al, oh, you better call your doctor. Your arm looks bad. So I call my doctor and he says, I, I just saw you two days ago. How, how bad could it be? So I went in there, the doctor sticks a needle in there, it's just all yellow. Uh -huh. So he tells us, well, you're gonna have surgery again today. So this is my third surgery. Open it up again, clean it out, and couldn't find where the infection was coming from. So they run blood tests. And he tells me, uh, the infection has gotten in your bloodstream. So they put a catheter directly into my heart for a fifth generation antibiotic to kill it. <clears throat> and he also tells me, he says, you may have osteomyelitis and we may have to cut off your arm. So I said, no, I said, uh, I came in here for something simple. Now you're telling me you're gonna cut off my arm? No, you're not cutting nothing off. So the f next, but I was in the hospital nine days that time. And then he comes, comes in and says, well, We'll go through the surgery one more time. I said, today, which is on a Sunday, October 31st. I said, today. And by two o'clock, because I ate breakfast at eight, I'll be done by six. You know, by two, my six hours is over. <clears throat> you clean up my arm now. He said, well, not today. I said, no, today. I'm not used to laying around. I'm laying around for nine days in a bed. I said, if you're not here by two o'clock, 201, I'm throwing everything out the window. <laughs> Doctors, nurses, furniture. Whenever he was there that day and they did the surgery, huh. ended up taking out 60% of my tendon on my tricep, which ended my career. What have you been doing since? Right at that time, my wife says, you know, it's about time you stay home, get a regular job. And I got a job with UPS. And I've been there seven and a half years and, and love it. I got benefits. I'm home every day, almost every day. Right. And I've, I've missed nine years of my kid's life. Now he's 17 and I'm there for him. I'm there and I coach baseball with him. I coach the wrestling team down in Tampa, which he's on the wrestling team. And I enjoy my life now. Does he want to be a pro wrestler one day? Or? No, <laughs> no, uh-uh. What is, go ahead. He, uh, <clears throat> that's the last thing. Back in my heyday, he was about four or five years old. And his big thing was Fraggle Rock. <laughs> okay, a little cartoon. And my wife would tell him, Michael, Michael, your dad's on TV. Oh no. He flip it over to the cartoon. He didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> now his big hero was Sting a few years back. I'm like, oh great. <laughs> <laughs> Good taste, kid. <laughs> yeah. What was your highlight of your career? When did you look back? If you were looking back, what can you say, oh, that's when I made it? I'm gonna say I made it. I got the recognition that everybody wants in this business out of Texas. And like I said before, when I got into NWA, it carried it over. And I had a reputation there and I, I never really knew what I was doing, but I guess I did something right because I had that uh, reputation follow. What was your favorite match? <clears throat> Man, I think my favorite was uh, Matt Bourne. 60 minute Broadway and then the extra 15 minutes on top of that. Is there anybody that you never got to wrestle that you wish that you could have wrestled? Arn Anderson. Arn Anderson, Arn used to compliment me all the time and I did the same with him. Arn was another one of my top 10 to me and, and Arn would say the same thing about me. He says, Al, 
you're the greatest. And I said, no, Arn, you're the greatest. I said, Arn was, Arn was an athlete. He was good. Do you have any regrets? Or would you change anything that you've done in your, in your past? Yeah, I would never go to the WWF. I'd have told Vince, forget it. Because he, to me, he ended my career. Do you have any advice you want to give out to anybody that wants to get into the business? Uh, grow, because nowadays, man, they've gotten so big. I mean, body is seven foot tall. The average size is six, seven, 300 pounds, ripped to shreds. Uh, if you want to get into the wrestling business now, I think I'd uh, say no. Get a regular job because the, the, the limelight is awesome. Women, you drugs if you want drugs, you booze. A big, it's a lifetime of party. Basically, it's all a lifetime of party, but there's no future at the end of it. The money that you think you make and you save and you end up spending it quicker than what you make it. I know guys who've gone through $1,500, $2,000 in a week, something in a day. In closing, do you have anything you want to say to your fans who might be watching this video too? Yeah, I know I'm a little bit over the hill, but uh, <laughs> I'm in my early 40s. But uh, yeah, I'd like to make a little bit of a comeback. And Philadelphia right now is giving me a spot. So hope to see some of my old fans out here again. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for being here. Enjoyed being here. Thank you. TitleMatchNetwork.com.